anyway, the, the first thing I wanted to ask about, just because I know there was a, um, a public hearing yesterday, um, is the comprehensive plan at King County. So tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on with that and, uh, you know, why people should care, because that just the phrase comprehensive plan makes some people's eyes fog over. Comprehensive plan is a bunch of policy wonk for really important decisions that will be made for the unincorporated area to determine how high buildings can go, how dense neighborhoods will be, and really how we create a more walkable, livable neighborhood in our unincorporated areas. For District 8, this includes Vashon Island, this includes White Center, and a tiny sliver in South Park as well. And, um, and it's a really important way for us to create connectivity around our community. A lot of folks don't realize they're crossing from Seattle to unincorporated area when they go south of Roxbury. But if you go south of Roxbury, you can just imagine how some of those buildings there could be purchased and potentially renovated, turned into storefront on the first floor, housing above. That's the definition of how we create thriving local communities, accessible neighborhoods, and more affordability as well. I'll just give you one anecdote about why it's important. I was talking to a doctor yesterday who provides services in White Center, and he said he wanted to be part of the comprehensive plan discussion because that is how we can create a new vision of what the downtown White Center core looks like. Many of those buildings um, have either been sitting empty for a long time since the tragic arson fire, and some of them could be turned into, some, into something more um, accessible with housing on top if we provided enough incentive for some of the developers, nonprofit developers, to come in and build up, use the airspace, create more housing, more amenities. But we have to make sure that there's the right balance of incentives as well as direction in the comprehensive plan. That's coming from a doctor in White Center who wants to see the area activated for walkability, livability, and a thriving local economy where he lives and works. You've kind of, you know, come into the middle of this county-wise, though. So what, uh, what's your focus right now as, you know, it gets to this stage of vetting? Well, it's really exciting to come in where we're at right now. Over the next five months, we will be engaged with the local land use committee to hear directly from community members about what they would like to see. We've only just begun to review a few of the chapters in the comprehensive plan, and each chapter will help dictate what the next 10-year plan will be for un our unincorporated areas. Now, I'm going to be going over to Vashon when they have the community um, meeting over there next month, and I'm also coordinating a roundtable discussion amongst community partners, leaders, businesses about what they would like to see for White Center as well. While the sub-area plan just occurred a few years ago for White Center, it's a really important opportunity for us to look at all of the unincorporated areas and marry and match it with the legislation that just came through the state legislature last year. House Bill 1220, as you might remember, was uh, a vision for how our state could try to be more inclusive and ideally more affordable and dense in certain areas. I would love to hear what the community has to say in White Center and Vashon Island and look at the opportunities that exist in House Bill 1220 and then see what we, else we can do for greater incentives to create more housing, mixed income housing, and mixed use buildings. When we create mixed use buildings, it is actually good for the economies. If we can create child care on the first floor or small business opportunities on the first floor, community gathering spaces on the first floor, and housing above, that serves everybody in our community. How do we escape, though, what's happened in so many places, including uh, West Seattle to some degree, where the new buildings come in and the rents are astronomical? So the small buildings that perhaps had to leave for the redevelopment or are still looking for places couldn't afford them. You were asking the question I actually asked in committee yesterday, what is included in the comprehensive plan that helps prevent displacement? I want to see anti-displacement strategies embedded into the comprehensive plan. Two really good examples that I'll give you is community preference and affirmative marketing, right? When we create new buildings that ideally are for the neighborhood that's being affected by high rents, high mortgages, and causing people to get pushed into, you know, further areas across King County, we should be prioritizing that population by affirmatively marketing to them to say, we're going to actually ask you to step out of this location as we build more affordable housing, but you'll have first opportunity to come back. That's community preference. And then when we do um, affirmative marketing, we reach out and directly work with community organizations and people who have connections on the ground with working families to try to get 
working families, lower income folks in as well as the market rate. When we do both, it actually makes a pencil. My concern right now is that um, there's we need to have more incentives in there to encourage developers to include more affordable housing on site. And one way that we do that is by giving them more incentives to go higher and a little bit denser so that it pencils out. Market rate plus low-income housing makes it something that is more lucrative for even um, nonprofit developers to make it pencil in the long run. Uh, so I think there's there's a combination of both incentives, height, and um, anti-displacement strategies like affirmative marketing and community preference that we should be looking at including in the comp plan. So when, when we talk affordable housing, that's, uh, as I was just reminded of writing a, a different story for our uh, West Seattle side. Um, that scopes, you know, a whole lot of, uh, of things. What, 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 what do you talk about when you talk about, you know, affordable housing? Maybe, let's say, if mixed use came into the, the, the downtown White Center core. Mm -hmm. Think about some of the workers that we know are desperately needed in our community. Teachers, nurses, child care providers. I want affordable housing to be all encompassing of everywhere from 0% area median income up to 60 and 80% area median income. In this uh, area right now, you need a salary of about eighty-one and a half thousand dollars a year for an affordable rental unit. That is really out of reach for a lot of a lot of teachers, a lot of nurses, and people who are just beginning their careers. Uh, so we need to have that mixed income option available, and we do that by making it pencil so that you can have market rate plus affordable units built on the same site. I'll also give you one more example here from our friends in West Seattle. Um, and I might have mentioned this to you before when I did a walking tour with the West Seattle Chamber of Commerce years ago. I was talking to a small business owner and on California Avenue and I said, if there was one thing that I could do, what would, what would you like me to do? If I had a magic wand, what would you like? And he said, look at that empty parking lot across the street. If we could turn that parking lot into housing with childcare on the first floor, then my workers would not be so stressed out about whether or not they were going to make it home on time to pick up their kiddos from daycare. They could literally live in the community that they work and their kiddos could be cared for and they would be accessible to them. That's the kind of vision that I think we can strive for in the comprehensive plan in unincorporated areas as well. Is this actually happening anywhere now or is it just kind of a, you know, a hope? Um, the type of building that we're talking about? <laughs> the type of thing yeah. that you're talking about. Uh, it is. I mean, it, especially as we look at some of the newer um, housing units that went in with the support of Jumpstart, many of which are still in District 8, some of which are here in West Seattle, and would love to bring you on a uh, tour. We're going to do a tour of some of those buildings that were fueled by funding from a Jumpstart. But you have childcare on the first floor. You have... Um, affordable housing above, you have community space. I'm thinking about, for example, uh, on uh, 13th and Fur, also still in District 8, um, uh, it is a community-driven affordable housing project that has affordable rental units above, childcare provided on site, and a community gathering space, meeting rooms, things like that, and it's beautiful, 13th and Fur. It's a great example of where we've taken what was a parking lot adjacent to a alleyway and converted into um, a high-rise affordable housing unit. And I should say high-rise, it doesn't have to be high-rise, right? Three, four stories is still creates more density than we see in many areas across our region. Yeah, I know that the, at least in the city, the uh, definition of high-rise is technically actually a whole lot of floors, but people look at it, you know, yeah. seven-story building, and it's like, oh my God, there's there's high-rises everywhere. Right, and you know, um, I, I, folks might remember that when I first ran for office in 2017, I was living in a four-story brownstone, a walk-up apartment in Queen Anne, and that four-story building had eight units in it but it's currently not allowed to be built anymore, right? The city had downsized so much, it was no longer legal to build that four-story building. That's why I'm so excited about the comprehensive plan, the legislation that the state legislature passed last year with uh, Representative Bateman's bill, House Bill 1220. It takes the vision of what the fabric of many of our neighborhoods used to be, three or four stories, and just allows for greater integration of those units to create density, but density that also fits with the character of the neighborhood. Literally the character of the neighborhood that was there 50, 60, 70 years ago, and helps to bring it back so we can all have a place to call home. So let's um, 
back up a little bit. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, what, what's it been like uh, transitioning from the city to the county these past couple months? People have been so incredibly kind at the county to onboard us. We had two days of orientation. Um, I think that it is very much a outcome of uh, the way in which the county works, finding common ground across such geographic diversity and frankly political diversity. People are often trying to uh, sit down and find where that common ground is and that's something that I pride myself on and uh, it's been very much welcome um, to be in that environment and to get caught up to speed on all that's at play. In addition to that, I've been going out and meeting with local jurisdictions, meeting with uh, the mayor and council members in Burien, met with the mayor and council members in Tequila. Uh, we've been to Vashon Island within the first, I think, few days of uh, our getting sworn in, and um, we're having a community meeting coming up in White Center, been on the phone with folks and uh, regular meetings as well with community members who want to get us caught up on various issues that they're working on. For me, what I'm hearing from these meetings aligns with what we heard in the campaign. People want a focus on health, housing, and economic stability. And that's both for workers and small businesses. So we've been out having discussions with folks on all three of those aspects. In small business, for example, we've talked to some of the small businesses affected by the raid of some of the gay bars on Capitol Hill and talking to them about how this comes on the heels of just making it through the impacts of the economic crisis that COVID imposed on the community. And to have that fear and intimidation felt by the type of um, enforcement that was placed upon them, that's not good for their business and it's definitely not good for the health and well-being of the community that attends those bars. So we're working with folks to try to make sure that we continue to uplift small business investments and that's just one example, as well as workers. We're having conversations with folks in unincorporated areas about how we can continue to support investments in a minimum wage that helps align with some of the local jurisdictions, plural, who've already taken action on increasing the minimum wage while thinking about how we make it implementable for small business. And so doing that in partnership with Councilmember Zahalai, Councilmember um, Dombowski, um, and really being thoughtful about how they approach that. On health, as you probably heard, many of the public health clinics are poised to close down. That's 78,000 people who directly receive health care from the public health clinics. So I'm doing everything we can to encourage the state legislature to lift the cap so that we can have additional funding talking to our congressional representatives as well. Uh, we have a safety net that has been preserved in this county, and many other counties have gone the way of outsourcing those services. This is a true public good that we'd like to see preserved, so this is gonna be a big priority of mine to see how we maintain those public health clinics. And lastly on housing, which we already talked about, really focusing on housing and equity, e housing equity in the comprehensive plan. What's it like though to try to you know keep track of all these different jurisdictions though that are within your district as opposed to previously you know city of seattle big but at least it was just one government one thing that you had to deal with well i think it's all about partnership and really identifying ways that we can be a strong partner with the local jurisdictions as i've talked to both mayors and council members the first question that i have is what would you like us to do how can we be a helpful partner if the county is to weigh in with you on something what would you like to see from us because it's about first asking that question versus jumping in with the immediate solution when those jurisdictions really do have purview over the policy and the county's there to be an ally, a supporter, and maybe a co-conspirator in some cases. Uh, but that's, I think, the first question you have to ask when working with the local jurisdictions, which I've tried to do for both Burien and Tequila, and of course our friends in Seattle who we stay in close touch with as well. So one thing that you mentioned uh, a couple minutes ago about the uh, the public health clinics and the uh, the, the states and uh, funding and whatnot, where does that all stand? I know that a couple of key legislative deadlines have passed, so is there any hope for any help this session? There is hope. I'm going to knock on wood today, right now perhaps. Uh, Senate Bill 5770 is um, slated for floor debate and discussion. Um, I am very thankful for the state legislators who have um, rallied behind Senator Jamie Peterson's bill and his leadership on this has been impeccable, uh, giving us the option to create more revenue for core King County services is not only helpful for the health and stability for King County, but it also affects our entire state, right? Uh, we have the largest population in King County, and if our health is to deteriorate or our services go away, it does affect the rest of the state as well, at least neighboring jurisdictions and counties 
who I think um, benefit from all of us having access to public health amenities and investments in fam uh, working families. Uh, so Senate Bill 5770 is still live up for discussion and debate today. And there's three pieces of legislation in the House. Uh, we are hopeful and thankful for the state legislators and their leadership on this issue. And I also know it's just not enough. So that's why we're reaching out to congressional partners as well. So some of what you mentioned in terms of uh, you know new revenue, is there a potential initiative or county legislation um, that would uh, raise money to cover some of this? Um, there's not that I'm aware of right now. There's not a, a led, you know, a, a, the, the, the reason that we have to have a legislative action first is that we're currently reaching our limits of what King okay. County can do, yeah. But all ideas are helpful, and if there's viewers or readers that are um, interested in working on solutions, uh, I know that uh, this is an issue that many people have asked for additional progressive revenue options. Um, much of that would rely on the state legislature to offer the county additional tools. So health being, health being uh, as you mentioned, uh, and as you mentioned in previous times that we chat, you know, a signature issue for you, um, aside from this obvious, you know, potential crisis, um, what else are you working on right now in the uh, the health arena? Well, I'm honored to have been elected as chair of the Public Health um, Board of Health, and um, Public Health Seattle King County is a joint venture between Seattle and King County. The Board of Health often just plays an administer administrative role, um, looking and providing oversight on how policies are going and getting a lot of report backs. But in this moment, I know that there's a lot of interest in collectively identifying ways that we can partner with local jurisdictions, especially to address the shadow pandemic isolation, depression, um, behavioral health, substance use issues. This is a big priority for us, so our work plan is going to include opportunities for all the board members to have their ideas included, including getting feedback on um, how we're doing with serving our most vulnerable community members. Um, and in addition to uh, Board of Health, uh, I wanted to mention that the Crisis Care Center levy implementation does go through our Health and Human Services Department. Um, excuse me, our Health and Human Services Committee, which I also chair. Uh, we have begun review of the implementation plan. Uh, the executive worked closely with stakeholders and community partners as they developed the implementation plan. It's jointly referred to the Regional Policy Committee, so Council Member Pete Van Reitbauer has uh, first purview over that policy. All members of the Regional Policy Committee will have a chance to review that, and then it gets sent to my Committee on Health and Human Services. This is going to be, I think, the number one most important investment we've made into behavioral health and substance use treatment in the last 40 years. Uh, it is in part a response to the reduced investment, the reduced services and support that we've seen over the last you know, four or five decades from the state and, and, and from the national level on uh, behavioral health and mental health needs, substance abuse issues. Uh, and it is the answer to the question that comes up often from firefighters and human service responders. They say there's nowhere to bring someone. There's no landing zone. So firefighters show up, they know somebody, but they don't have a place to take people. This is in part the answer to where we can take people. So there is a landing zone and people can get access to the health services they need to get stabilized. And that will go through our committee um, with uh, wrapping that up before the end of quarter two. So how far out then do you think that we might be in terms of years for some of those facilities that were talked about in the um, in the measure um, to actually be built and the, open? The brick and mortar five facilities, um, I think it's various stages of, of whether or not there's um, a location that's already been thought of or um, a facility that can be enhanced. Um, so the good news is that we have a mobile response approach that will be deployed in the implementation plan prior to brick and mortar coming online. And that's something that we heard from many of the stakeholders was desired. We don't want folks to sit on their hands while construction is occurring. They want a mobile response, so that's built into it. The second thing that's really important is that the crisis care center levy included heavy emphasis on workforce training. So the workforce training element gets started right away as we build that career pipeline so that people are ready to provide services, whether it's mobile services or in a center. So they'll be ready to plug in exactly, and go. Exactly, exactly. And and it, I think, echoes some of the work that we worked on for the last six years at the City of Seattle where we knew we needed to make investments in the workers, the workforce, human service providers, because they were facing 40 to 60% turnover rates. You can't provide services to the most vulnerable community members if your workforce is constantly being 
turned over. You can't create trust with a mo really vulnerable community um, if you have a vacancy rate of 40 to 60 percent. So we uh, are really thrilled about the workforce element of this and that career pipeline and the plug-in ready-to-go workers that will be available once those centers open and will be deployed on the mobile approach as well. So where's um where's the line going to be then between the you know the, that kind of crosses jurisdictional lines right like for example because last week we were over at uh, Seattle nine one one and we were talking about the care team mm. and those are the kind of people that it would seem would need a place like the eventual or the services so that's exactly yeah the care team um, health one for example in Seattle we did a lot of ride alongs with health one uh, it is the the vision of how we're trying to you know provide a array of providers to show up when someone's having a crisis, that I feel like we've made a lot of inroads. We have, uh, I think, a lot to be proud of. We can compare ourselves to the CAHOOTS plan. We can compare ourselves to other um, strategies for the first responder dual response model and uh, co-response model that is heavy on social workers and case managers and um, firefighters. But all of them will say, there's not a place to bring someone right now. You don't want a revolving door, door at Harborview and you don't want a revolving door at the jail. Um, and so this is, I think, to be complimentary of all of those efforts that you just mentioned, the care team, um, Health One. And I was just in Durian the other day talking to Chief Bo and they were mentioning all the invest investments that they put into the um, uh, MHP, the mobile health pilot, and the work that they're doing to partner officers with firefighters and case managers, it's complementary of that too. We need somewhere for those teams to bring someone eventually so that they can get stabilized. Yeah, heavy expectations. So on the uh, topic of, um, of public safety, because that's still something that's weighing really heavily on people's minds, and the county has a unique role because the county is responsible for courts and jails and so forth. Um, I was particularly interested in, in last week's um, update from the county executive's office about the fact that his goal of perhaps you know closing the uh, the, the you know the youth jail as the phrase goes um, wasn't going to be on track. I'm curious, um, you know, what your thoughts were both on what he had to say and where things stand. So I think number one, he's still committed to closing down the the youth facility. Uh, I think that what he raised was the number of compounding issues that need to be addressed as we transition folks out. Um, I, am, I am interested as well in making sure that kiddos have a place to go so that they can get stabilized and get placed back into society. Um, and we also know that there's um, changed policies both locally and at the state that are leading to more people interacting with law enforcement now than there has been in the past. We have to have a balanced approach. If folks are going to interact more with law enforcement, we have to have an array of services that we can offer those uh, youth. And I think ultimately working towards the timeline that he sent out is the right thing to do. I think a lot of people wish it was faster. I think he does too. Um, but right now, I think we're going to work in partnership with him to make sure that we can meet that new deadline. It's kind of a tough situation currently, though, because even in my 45 years of doing this, I've never quite seen the amount of, uh, of high profile, you know, violent crime involving youths. Um, so people say, you know, well, there has to be a place that, you know, there, there has to be some sort of, you know, punishment, if you will. It's really hard to make people understand, you know, what the ultimate goal is of, of not having incarceration. Right, right. And I, and I think that, you know, we have a lot to do on the front end as well. A lot of the kiddos, a lot of the youth that are experiencing, um, or engaged in violence, or gun violence, interpersonal violence, they also had three years of dealing with the pandemic and the crisis that that also created additional pressures that way. So we have a lot of work to do on the upstream side, and then we also have to figure out where some of these youth can go if it's not into uh, the youth jail. Some folks have talked a lot about youth homes and having safe places where it, there is a rehabilitative aspect of it, but I think a lot of that's to be determined. So also on the uh, subject of, uh, of, of uh, criminal justice, public safety, um, anything else that's uh, surfaced to you that's uh, coming up late that people should keep an eye on regarding any of the uh, agencies or services that the county provides? Well, I will say that we had a joint meeting between um, the city of Seattle, King County, and other local jurisdictions to reconvene the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. 
This is something that um, we know has plagued our region, plagued this country, frankly, and as guns are pervasive in community, they end up in the hands of youth. We saw the tragic death here in West Seattle just a few weeks ago, and we continue to see a call for more to happen. I'm really... Um, optimistic about some of the legislation that's been sponsored and championed by Representative Liz Berry over the years and know that she's been in touch with the youth who are calling for more action at the state level right now. Um, but I would say that youth violence, it is a public health issue. It's also um, a public safety issue and it's one of those issues where we know that if we work in conjunction and partnership with local jurisdictions, we can see solutions. None of this, none of these issues stop at any one border, so we have to be jointly working across jurisdictions to address uh, youth violence, gun violence specifically. Is there anything specific that you particularly, you know, have been advocating for or you know proposing? Well, we've been in touch with the um, youth, for example, at Ingram High School um, over the last few years, specifically working on more mental health services was their ask. We were able to incorporate $3 million in the budget last year for youth mental health services, and I know that's something that Liz Berry has also taken up as well. But listening to the youth directly and their ask being um, specifically around ratios of counselors to youth, that is the thing that we really tried to focus on. So um, tell me how people can best interact with you and, and make their concerns known. You've mentioned a few public meetings and some already some tours and things, but you know, what's, what's your style going to be? What are you planning on doing so that people don't just look at you as here's this government person on this side? <laughs> Well, we're um, bringing back District 8 Days. This is something that Councilmember McDermott did actively as well. A hashtag D8 Days. Uh, we're coming to your neighborhood soon. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, already been out to Vashon Island. Next up is White Center. We have a whole series of meetings planned, both for the CID, Pioneer Square, downtown Seattle. We're going back to Tequila and, um, again, uh, here in West Seattle, of course, uh, my neighborhood. So we'll have District 8 Days where we're meeting with small businesses and workers, local organizations, uh, and that's one way to engage with us if you'd like us to come out and, and actually see the organization, the facility you're working at, and have a conversation with us in community, that's one way for us to engage. The second thing is we have these roundtables, regular roundtable meetings that are focused on um, various topics. Uh, so we have a worker roundtable, a housing roundtable that will focus on the comprehensive plan as well, and then community um, health, community safety, that's another way to engage with us. Uh, we have an active, um, I, I'm very interested in making sure that we're responding to all the emails that are coming in and scheduling meetings with people who are asking. So we have a very full calendar right now of people who just want to put something on our radar, give us background on an issue, and of course um, help respond to the asks that they might have. But you can reach me. Reach me directly at teresa.mosqueda at kingcounty.gov and we'll make sure to get back to you. We have an incredible team. Uh, Aaron House is our Chief of Staff. Chris Lampkin is Deputy Chief of Staff. Melanie Cray is our Policy Director. And Camila Brown, uh, who we're so thankful to have. She actually formerly worked with Larry Gossett. Um, she is our Chief Operations Officer. So all of us are ready to work and serve uh, the, the residents, the diverse community in District 8. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you guys again. Appreciate it.